What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. As always, I suck at this techno- technological te- are you, tech stuff. Are we unmuted? We should be unmuted. So if we're not unmuted, shoot me a comment real quick, and I will make sure that we're unmuted. What's up, Cliff, our our, uh, our biggest fan? Thank you for tuning in. We love you, man. You're on every show. You're like the first guy on there. We need to send you a little care package. I think we should send yeah. Cliff a care package. Oh, we have. Yeah, we're we're going to be ordering some sweatshirts soon. Yep. Um, that hoodies. We're hoodies. Hoodies. Cool term. Hoodies. Yeah. With a with a hood on the back. Cameron really likes sweatshirts. Sweat, I do. Sweat material. He's wearing camo Crocs, <laughs> sweatpants, and a hoodie. He didn't think that I'd but call him out because it's below the table. Yeah. <laughs> come on, man. He's, uh, uh, he's looking cozy. Yeah. We we we'll, we'll be having some um, hoodies coming soon that we're going to be giving out. So awesome. Um, be on the lookout for this. Some hoodies, and we're gonna. I think we're gonna get some stickers and stuff too. So. Make sure you log on and uh, maybe you'll win some. But uh, if you're watching, please share this on your Facebook. You can send this link out to other people uh, just so we can grow this broadcast. We've got an awesome guest, Ethan, on tonight. We're excited to introduce you all to him in a second. A um, bunch of y'all probably already know him. And uh, what else was I going to say? Yeah. All right. So our Facebook group, we have, uh, we've started a Facebook group. We've already got a Facebook page. But our group, you can hop on there and uh, ask to request to, to join and we're just trying to start like a little, you know, community of people that listen to this podcast and listen to the show. Um, so y'all can talk, you know, talk, ask fishing questions on there, share your, uh, your days on the water and, and just hopefully create a community, you know, create, maybe make some buddies that you can get out in the water with and go fishing with. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, especially if you listen to this podcast and you maybe don't live in this state or not in Wilmington. Yeah. And you're like, man, I really want to come down there and fish. Yeah. It'd be a great way to, to hook up with somebody and get someone to show you around on the water. For sure. And yeah, like Cameron said, it is also a hookup site. You can hook up with anybody on yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> for $10. <laughs> for $10. And you pay us and we'll let you hook up with them. But um, but yeah, so go check out the Facebook group. It's Eastern Current Fishing. Um, also, I've, uh, I have created, and we're going to talk more about this in the next episode, I've created a Patreon account. Um, it's gotten kind of expensive on the back end to run this. I'm paying for a lot of like uh, subscript membership type deals, 10, 15 bucks a month. Um, and so I, I'm not, I don't have the, the URL for y'all this week, but I'll have it next week. And so what y'all can do, if y'all really like the show, you can make like a, a one-time donation of five bucks, six bucks, seven bucks, or you can do uh, monthly contributions, which just help. It's just going to help us pay for the, the back end stuff to run the show. Um, and eventually what we're going to try to do, and I, I mean, I, I was ho- hesitant to do this for a while, but a lot of podcasts do this is create some extra content each week. Um, that if you are one of those Patreon members, um, you'll be able to have exclusive access to, um, that exclusive content. We'll be, you know, diving more in depth and some different details and, um, some different stuff with our captains that we talked to on the show and, and with yeah. me and Cameron as well, just kind of diving in and, and sharing a little bit more than we share on the show. We have such a short amount of time. An hour seems like a lot, but it goes by really quickly. Yeah, and I think we're gonna we'll probably start adding some videos on there that are just really short, but you know, come down to like what knots do we use for yep. certain lures, and you know, how do you tie braid to um, monofilament or or leader or whatever. Um, so just just to get more content out there and stuff that's that's helpful. Definitely, yeah, I think it'll be a huge deal. But but yeah, we're just we just want to create uh, some more content and. Um, not have to just pay for all these subscriptions out of our pocket. We're not looking to make a bunch of money doing this. We just want to uh, to be able to. We want to keep doing it. We want to keep doing it, <laughs> and we want to make more more content to put out there for y'all. So, <clears throat> so I'll have more information about that for y'all next week. Um, the Facebook group, and that's it. Yeah. So I've I'm just gonna plug myself here real quick. I still have a few striper dates available in Weldon. Um, so if you want to get up there and do some fly fishing, light tackle fishing for striped bass and Weldon, yeah. Yep. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's sweet. I mean, you gotta if you've never been, you gotta experience it. It is unreal. Yeah, it's a cool, it's a really cool fishery, and uh, just a lot of people from around our state as well as Virginia are there that time of year. It's a great place to just go and fish, hang out at the ramp in the afternoon, and and network with some other fishing guides and and uh, other anglers, and just you know get to know some other some fellow fishermen from our state and from our area. So. All right, that's enough of me and Cameron rambling. I'm going to bring on, make sure first he's not mm-hmm. muted. I don't think he's muted. He looks good. Ethan, what's up, man? What's up, guys? How's it going? Going good. If y'all can hear Ethan, or if you cannot hear Ethan, same deal. Send us a comment. <laughs> yeah, let us know. <laughs> but, man, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Definitely, definitely. Uh, we're stoked to have you on. Ethan, is uh, he's a he's a charter captain out of the, the Wrightsville Beach, Topsville Beach area, and uh, catches a bunch of fish. 
very knowledgeable, and so we 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 thought it'd be awesome to have him on and and pick his brain a little bit. So you want to kind of we always start like this, but just kind of share your backstory, like how you got into fishing and kind of your just your whole um, just your whole life story from day one until now. <laughs> My whole life story. Yeah. Whole life story. Pull up the chairs <laughs> from when you were a baby. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'm a guide up here at Topsail Island. Um, I only got into fishing about four or five years ago. Um, I played sports my entire life and then one sports in and I was like, what am I going to do? And like went into business and opening businesses and like, I didn't find that fulfilling that I, I wasn't competing any longer. So I was like, Oh, maybe I'll pick up fishing. I had a bunch of friends in the area that were into fishing and, um, my little brother and I actually started fishing on paddle boards by my, behind my mom's house on topsail. And, uh, one winter there was a school back there, like 50 fish and, we had no idea that what we were doing. We just pulled our paddle boards up on the island and we would see these silver flashes, had no idea what they were. And uh, started casting and started catching these mid to upper slot fish that were all piled up behind our house. And after that, it was like, it's on. This is what I'm doing. And um, it just became uh, like an addiction for me. Yeah. Um, and it's like once you feel that first pull of a redfish, you're hooked. You know? Oh, yeah. No especially, when you get those, uh, <laughs> especially when you get those bigger <laughs> fish, you know? So um, I just started I just started fishing. I started reading about red fishing. Um, watched all YouTube videos about red fishing. Anything I could get my hands on about a red fish, I studied. And uh, and then I just I just went for it. I bought a boat with my tax return. Nice. Um a little uh it was like a little luma craft it was like 16 foot with a 50 johnson two stroke on the back of it that thing scooted across the water that's awesome and uh my little brother and i we just we just started fishing and uh and then it just progressed i flipped a bunch of boats and now i'm in a maverick and uh i'm just i, I it's just like you can't beat red fishing you know if you can catch them in the grass and the spartina grass tailing or you know, crawling up banks with flies. I mean, that's that's a adrenaline packed uh, adventure with you and whoever's on the boat with you. You know, it's hard to beat right. for sure. I think a cool thing about your story, man, and it's inspiring to other people because you get a lot of I, it, through my time guiding. I've had a lot of uh, different people reach out, um, younger younger guys usually that. Or not, maybe not always younger guys, but guys that like, man, I want to, I want to be a fishing guide. Like, how can I be a fishing guide? And and I think it's cool, like how you kind of came into it taking you know the time that you had from you said you had another business going um and using that spare time to to kind of learn learn to fish the area that you're in really well and then you know start that business and start that venture moving out into something that's pretty scary when you start to guide i remember my first guide trip i was absolutely terrified and we did not catch fish it was like middle of the winter (laughs) freezing cold (laughs) and we didn't catch fish for i mean until the last like 25 minutes of the trip and i stumbled into the school of fish my A spot, the fish were not happy. The B spot, the fish weren't there. And then I went to this last spot, and I was like, God, I hope there's some fish in here. And we caught a couple fish. And, it, it, I mean, they were little fish, but it saved the day. And I was like, all right. I can." I, the whole trip, I was like, all right, I'm not doing this here. I'm, I'm just going to go guide in Alaska. There's no way I'm guiding here again. <laughs> and then, you know, it, it pushed me to run another trip and another trip. But, man, it's just cool. I just encourage anyone, wherever they are, if, they, if it's something they want to do, to do it life short and, and doing something that you love. And like you're saying, like the competition aspect of it, like not even against other people, but against the fish mm-hmm. and learning and like mm-hmm. getting beat and like having to overcome the tough days of fishing, I think is huge. So that's, that, that's an inspiring part of your story, man. I think that's super cool. Um, I had a question too. I forgot what it was. Oh, well, but yeah, so that's super cool. So tell, tell everyone else what you, uh, your, your other business that you run out there at Topsail is. Oh, Fractured Prune Donuts. Um, we're in Surf City, um, about 100 yards south of the Surf City Bridge. Um, it's all made-to-order donuts. You come in, you pick a donut that you want, we cook it right in front of you. So you always leave the shop with that hot donut. Nice. Um, hot which are hard to beat, on. you know? <laughs> if people come on vacation, they can't stop. Yeah, yeah for sure. They eat donuts for like seven days straight. We know them by their first names towards the end of the – they're into their stay. That's awesome. Yeah, everyone seems to like let it slide a little bit on vacation with them. Oh, no doubt. You know, we're oh, on vacation. Yeah, I'll eat whatever. Anything yeah, that's they good. go home ten pounds every year. <laughs> yeah, Heck for sure. Yeah. One belt. I do that on vacation. I eat yeah. whatever I want. I know. I feel. I, I feel like I might. 
I, I think I'm on vacation all the time the way I eat, so I need to get that <laughs> under control. <laughs> but um, but that's awesome, man. So um, let's talk a little bit about, you, you know, you love red fishing. Is there any other uh, type of fishing here that you focus on besides the redfish? These are questions yeah. I already know the answers to, but I'm asking them for, for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so so it, like, you know that, it, dude. Why are you asking that? Um, I love catching speckled trout, too. Um, I focus really hard on those fish early fall um, and then springtime. Wintertime, you know, we can run up and still catch trout, and that's still fun. But I like to target big speckled trout on top water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I love. And I spend a good – I dedicate – um certain months to you know finding those bigger fish um and it, it's it, there's nothing like a big top water blow up of speckled trout you know oh for sure i love seeing those them swirl and belly roll on top of it um and yeah it's just fun it's a good I change love- of pace man from like you know what we do and cameron does as well like focusing so hard on sight fishing all the time it's an yes. awesome change of pace. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really it's it's relieving. I mean, sure. you can get a little burnt out on on like always pulling, you know, having to worry about a the tides all the time, and <laughs> just like, yeah, am I gonna yeah. get stuck back here? And then you just like, oh man, it's so relieving to go fish for trout for a couple months, oh, yeah. like really hard, and just don't have to, you know, drop your trolling motor in the water, and you're like, oh, this is great. In a couple of days, I'll I leave the push ball at the house. I'm like, I'm not even gonna try to like, go <laughs> yeah. look for that. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it is a really good change of pace, definitely for sure. So yeah. you were saying that you like to really try to target the bigger speckled trout. If you don't mind me asking, what are some of the tactics? And I know, I know you said top water, and that's definitely a key, a key bait I think in the arsenal for for big speckled trout. But what are some of the other things you look for? Mm-hmm. You know, in in the water, like a spot wise. Not saying tell me your spots, but like what are you looking for for an area that might produce a big speckled trout for you? So I like grassy areas. You know, any underwater vegetation is very good for uh, big trout. Yep. Um, what, um, and, you know, current flow is really good for big trout, too. Um, and I like I like to fish bays for trout. Yeah. Um, you oh. know, over either um, sand or mud. Um, it's kind of hard to go into that too much without no, for sure. too I'm much with you. about it, but... You know, it's it's certain phases of the moon that I'm looking for those bigger fish. Um, yeah, and, I feel like know, the new moon for sure for me is like big trout time. Like I'm I'm catching a lot of my bigger trout around the new moon and on Instagram and water too. Temp. Water, water temp, temp too. is huge for sure. Huge. Once it hits a certain degree, um, that that bite can just turn on yeah. big time. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, what's that? What's that water temp that you like to see if you're going to throw a top water plug? It's got to be close to 60. Close to 60. 58s. 58s when I like first start to see it. Um, and then, you know, anything past 58, it's usually on. But my sweet number is like 62, 63. Yeah. It's when mm-hmm. I find those bigger fish. Those warming uh-huh. trends for yeah. sure. It really does seem on like On top they... water, on top water. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You on top go water. through and, you know, throw mirror lures or bounce, but uh, bounce jigs on the bottom. But yeah, for those big blow ups, that's. It's kind of the temp yeah. I like. For sure. Where really, it, it, well, it just really seems like the, the trout turn off to top water like later in the fall. Oh, yeah. They want an easy meal for sure. Yeah. Something like, that they feel like they Something can... like trout tricks or, you know, mirror lure. Yeah, I like the uh, the slow rolled paddle tail too when it gets cold. Just yes. real slow on the bottom. Yes. What sucks late winter though is that grass, that snot grass that we see mm-hmm. here in North Carolina. And I know it's in it's in South Carolina and Virginia as well, but – you fish something too slow and too close to the bottom um, in the winter, it gets, you know, grassed up every cast. And then as that water starts to warm, we're like entering that time where it's extremely annoying because that grass is dying coming off the bottom and, and then it's starting to float up everywhere, everywhere. And it just gets very, very frustrating. Yeah. That's when you're just begging for top water. Cause you're like, all right, that's the, one. I can yeah. kind of work yes. my top water around this I grass know. a little bit. Ethan, yep. one thing, um, one thing that I've never really focused on, and, and, and maybe it's not really that productive around here, but does our, it be, and mainly because I'm focused on redfish like in the spring, but does our trout fishing get um, better again in the spring? Um, yeah, I, I like fishing for trout, you know, early spring. Once that water temp gets up and I'm allowed to throw that plug, you know, I do see a good amount of trout around. Um, you know, exiting all the creeks, working their way back out. 
um, in that transition period, I, I, when I start to notice them moving, then, you know, I'll focus on fishing for those uh, fish during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we had someone on the show, I can't remember who it was, um, like a few weeks ago, and I think they're up in the Pamlico. Um, but they were like, yeah, so the, the trout fishing is really good in the fall and I'm using a lot of top water on like m- more like out in, in the bays. Oh, yeah. Who was that? And then as winter progresses, you know, they push really deep into creeks Yep. and then yeah. as spring comes, they kind of come back out and they fall back into their fall patterns. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, yeah. I, you know, I've never really tr- focused on trout in the spring, but I'm curious, I wonder if it would be productive around here using that same methodology yeah. i think it would what, what 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 do you have to say on that even yeah definitely you know as those fish transition you want to catch them during that transition period you know and they will come back out to those flats back out to the grass um and they they will they'll be there um yeah i'm with you it, on that. And, and we do catch good fish during the spring here too yeah i think mm-hmm. that uh even more so than just like do them beginning to do that again in the spring it's almost like the water temperature, like you get four or five days of warm weather, those fish are going to slide out of their holes and get up mm-hmm. on the flats again. Mm-hmm. Um, they yeah. want to be in those areas where they can easily transition in and out of those two patterns. And, yeah. and then once that water temperature stays there, you know, more and more fish are going <laughs> to make those out. same moves. Yep. Yeah. And they just mm-hmm. like it in the, in, when it's really cold or when, when, you know, mid winter, middle of winter, those tr- like you can see them and oh, they, yeah. you can't get them to eat. No. There's a trick. They will drive you crazy. They will drive you crazy. That's the, that's the truth. I've they tried will. so many times, especially this year. I feel like I've seen a lot more trout, like in deep holes. Yeah. Um, further back in creeks, and just like, oh my god, I can't tell you how many casts I've tried to get to, to, yeah. to catch them with, and just so unproductive. I mean, I've tried fifteen lures on <laughs> in one day trying to get them to bite, and they're just like total lockjaw. one thing i found on artificial is and i suck at this i'm so bad at this because the water's so clear just mm-hmm. like we're focused on sight fishing redfish like if you know there's trout that's, that have been in this hole it's like i want to go up there and see and make sure they're in there you know if i make 10 yeah, casts yeah, and don't yeah. get a bite but i think sitting back and not making really long casts yeah and and the times that i've had luck on artificials in the winter when it's cold like that and that really clear water mm-hmm. if it's not on like a warming trend is with really light leader, you know, six and eight pound leader and a lot of it, like, you mm-hmm. know, seven or eight feet of a fluorocarbon on the end. And, um, if you're not doing that, another good trick is, is live mud minnows or live shrimp. <laughs> yeah. But I um, tried to find some live mud, mud minnows the other day. Cause I knew where all those trout yeah. were. And I was like, all right, something's got to work. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to get these mud minnows and try and get them to eat those. And That's I, the problem. I couldn't find any. No one, yeah, no one has them. Somewhere. You got to go catch them. But uh, that takes a lot of work. You got to catch your bait and then go catch your catch your fish. But, but yeah, so trout fishing, man. It's it's. Uh, I'm excited to get back into the spring trout fishing, Ethan. I know you are too. But let's talk about your bread and butter, what you really like doing, which is the the sight fishing for redfish, and kind of take me through what we've been the the kind of the pattern we've been in this winter pattern, and uh, let, then we'll kind of after we're done with that and picking a, picking apart that a little bit, we'll move into what we're about to start seeing in the spring. Um, so winter time, a lot of these fish are hanging around holes, um, kind of where there's big flats and there's like a ditch on the side of a big flat. So, yeah. you know, on a higher tide, they can come up, they can warm up, they can search for some food. Um, that's kind of where I've been finding my fish. Um, and they've been, it, it's a little different this year too, you know, to last year we were seeing big schools of big fish. And I think what um, the reason for that was is the year before that freeze killed off all of the smaller fish. So last year, you know, there was big schools of big fish around because those are the ones that survived. Um, But this year, I mean, there's still some good fish around. There's still some big fish around. Uh, They're just mixed in um, to the other schools. But red fishing remains good and you know wherever there's tidal flow holes and a big flat there should be fish around yeah um because they will sit in this oh sorry keep going the lag messes me up i always interrupt people (laughs) um but they'll they'll sit in those holes and they'll just come up and rise up um then you can catch them on the flat through like mid to high tide yeah unless you're dealing with these big you know big tidal swings that we're seeing again now um but yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I target. 
Yeah, that that's cool. I, I, and the one thing, like you said, they like those flats and those deep holes, and they're in a lot of them. But like, I think a lot of the people that get so frustrated with the wintertime red fishing is that you know they just look in a small area. Like, it, if you're going to find fish to to target and to fish this time of year, this is in South Carolina, Georgia, um, where we are, and even like the southern part of Virginia and up in the Pamlico. Mm-hmm. It's like those fish. You know, you've got to cover a lot of water. Like in the summer. I'd say 99% of the fish live in 50% of the water. And in the wintertime, I think that goes down to like 90% of the fish live in 2% of the water. And so like, yeah. if you're just going to go look at like, you know, this small little section of marsh that, you know, you've done good in the summer and you'll get real discouraged. I mean, mm-hmm. yesterday I scouted and I ran, I don't know how many miles up the waterway looking through different, different areas, but mm-hmm. a lot of stuff. And, and it, I only let myself check areas that I hadn't checked and it was pretty unproductive. It was slightly productive, but, um, you know, and, and I spend a lot of time out there, so don't get discouraged. I mean, really spend your time. Like if you get a pretty sunny day, I know it's really tempting to sit in one spot and mm-hmm. catch a bunch of fish, but travel along, look for trout, look for redfish. It's a great time of year to find areas where these fish are hanging out, um, that you can, you can, you know, if, if there's a school of redfish somewhere now, they're going to kind of, you know, break up and fill that area of marsh up for the spring. And, yeah. um, and don't look in the areas that I like to fish or that Ethan likes to fish. Try to pick some other areas <laughs> yeah. where that Cameron likes to fish. But um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's, there's a and slow down too. Yeah, slow down. People have a tendency to go through an area and work it real quick, and you know, throw a cast very quickly up a bank, and if they don't get anything, um, just move on. Yeah. I mean, if you're sitting on an area that looks good, there's bait around. Slow it down. Maybe throw you know, a few different soft plastics or flies in that area to pick those fish up, you know? Um, cause I can't tell you how many times I've been working through a marsh and I'll go through it and maybe I turn my head for one second and 20 fish slide by me, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. And then I go back in there and I'm like, Oh, there's the, the fish are right here. I can't believe I just went right mm-hmm. past them. So, yeah. you know, in that clean water, when that wind's down, take time, get on your platform or up on your cooler and slowly go through there and really watch the water because they can blend pretty well when you get when they get over you know oysters or any of that grass oh yeah even they, over they sand you know they, they they can blend in real well they're mm-hmm. like little mirrors swimming around right now yeah yeah you they, know, are. They, they reflect so well what's around them so it's hard to see um, yeah you know that that's huge man so one thing that that can be frustrating and me and cameron both were talking about how we ran into this about a week ago is some days these fish just don't eat nearly as well as other days. You know, like it, you're on the school the day before, and some sometimes it's weather. I think a lot of times it has to do with barometric pressure when I've looked back mm-hmm. at it and been like, because the, the other day it was a warming day, and Cameron and I were both fishing, and we could not get that group of redfish to eat worth a crap. Nope. You know, and then two days later they were chewing again really well. But what are what are some of the tactics when you're on fish if they're really, really, really – finicky to eat maybe not spooky but they're just not eating are, are there any baits or any presentation styles that you like i back way up i back off those fish you mean like with the boat like from your where you're casting yep. from gotcha yeah i back my boat up and i kind of just sit there and watch them um and you know those fish would just move directly they'll go up and down the bank um you know and it i switch it up you know i use procure a lot during the winter months um, and usually, which particular flavor you like? Shrimp. I like <laughs> shrimp. that sauce. Shrimp. Shrimp. <laughs> shrimp. Um, I like the, I I like shrimp. the shrimp too because I can squirt on my sandwich, smear it around, and have a extra taste. <laughs> <laughs> the minhaden is not good on the sandwich. Uh, that's <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> yep. Just and then just switch your baits up. You know what I mean? Work with the paddle tail, then go to a jerk shad, then go to a spoon. You know, just keep switching it up. Um, but I had a captain, another local guy up here, kind of turned me off to using gulp recently because he said during the summertime he came up on a school and he started throwing gulp at these fish and all of a sudden they just busted up and just moved on. Really? It's like I, I feel like when fish <laughs> tend to see, you know, the same bait or the same scent over and over and over again, they start to catch on. Um, mm-hmm. So I kind of just try to use, you know, different plastics you know you see something in a store that looks like a fish would eat it then you know take it out and give it a shot because that may be the new hot bait yeah for yeah. sure I th- i'm with you trying different stuff trying different patterns yeah. different colors yeah, yeah, yeah. is there a what colors do you like this time god i got the hiccups what colors do you like this time of year that creo croaker z-man that they came out with this year 
is killer. It's yeah. like that green with the silver specks in it, yep. with the white underbelly. Um, that works really good. Um, the bad shads from Z Man work really good for me. Same with the Creole Croker. That Creole Croker and that clean water, you know, you're pairing it with what the watercolor is. Yep. So white, you know, green, blue, um, light colors. You know, nothing mm -hmm. really dark. If you're going to fish that stained water, or, you know, a little dirtier water, you can work with that bad shad, which is a little darker. Um, and that red bone Z-Man. Um, those are all sol solid colors. I feel like what it comes down to, that natural color this time of year, the water's so clear, is like you want something that's going to ease into their vision. Mm -hmm. Like if yeah. it's a real solid dark color, a real bright color that kind of, you know, startles them a little bit, I feel like they're much less likely. And they're already so spooky as is right now. Yeah, they are. A lot of pressure. And that, that brings me to another point that I think is important to talk about, um, you know, because I have trouble with it as well, especially on charters um, of like, and we've talked about this before, Cameron, like taking care of your, your schools of fish. Like if you know where fish are, if you're fishing to them, it's like, I love to sit there and catch 50 of them. But like, sometimes it's like, all right, let's catch, you know, four five, six fish and then mm -hmm. move on, look for some different fish. It's, you know, even if you feel like you're the only one fishing an area or you're not the only one fishing an area, it, it, just take care of those fish because the, the less you beat on them, you know, the, the longer they're going to last. And um, I feel like we all, us three try to do a good job of that. But it's, I mean, it's tough. It's very tough. But I mean, um, if you want to have a school fish well for a long time, that's mm -hmm. the best way to do it, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would agree. So. And if you're going to go beat them up, give them, you know, a few days to recover too. Yeah, definitely, you know? definitely. If I'm taking clients out to a spot and we're wearing fish out, I won't go back in there for three or four days. Yeah. I'm going to switch up my routine and go somewhere else. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's important to do. And it's, I mean, I wish we had more fish here and more, more schools in the winter. We've got schools of fish, but they just get so wadded up and thick. It's, it's tough. It's, I wish I had 15 spots I could go hit in a day, but, <laughs> right. but I don't this time of year. And, uh, spoiler alert, if anybody's booked with me for the next, <laughs> next couple of weeks, but, but I don't, you know, I've got, I got a handful of good spots, but, um, but yeah, so th you know, if, when you're out there next time and you feel like maybe you've caught enough fish, go look for another school of fish, go look for some trout. You know, another thing too is, is, uh, it's a good time of year to start sliding off the beach and looking in the ocean. I mean, it's been all winter, but we're finally getting some calm days to go look in the surf mm -hmm. for fish. And those fish have had no pressure because it's been so freaking windy, windy yeah. all winter. So oh, man, I bet yeah. they would eat so well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Do you, uh, do you like to fish any hard baits, Ethan, for, for redfish ever? Or are you mostly sticking to the soft plastics? Usually just soft plastics. I'll throw a 17 at a, or MR 17 at a redfish. Yeah. Usually when those fish are, you know, spooky or shut down, my last resort is to go to an MR 17. I've had that be my day saver a few different times. Um, and I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but they follow it. You can watch them follow it and then finally eat it or spook off of it. But, you know, it's intriguing to them. I don't know. I can't tell you why, but no, I'm with you. I think that's a spin, man. Same reason it gets the trout. I think when it when it gets cold and that bait, you can twitch, twitch, and just let it sit in front of those redfish and like just yeah. long enough. They can to think about it. <laughs> they can yeah, think exactly. about it for a little bit. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and and that's one of those baits too. That's nice for this time of year because you have so much of that that crud on the bottom. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, floating through the water. I mean, if you if you're picking up a ton of stuff off the bottom. I always try and use a suspending bait. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. I mean, it'll save you a lot of frustration. Yeah, that's for sure. And and as yeah. this water warms too, like even the soft plastics, you can work them a little faster. These fish are a little more aggressive. Yeah. Or you use like a bottom. really really light jig head. Yeah, like super a light jig head or something. What what's your what's your go to winter winter soft plastic color? Man, and well style? I'm gonna say the opposite of Ethan, but I I love gulp. Yeah, yeah. in the winter. <laughs> Uh, especially just a white jerk shad. Yeah. I really like, uh, ever since you turned me on to those paddle tails. I turned um, you on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You Which this. paddle tails? The, uh, the, uh, diesel minnow. Yeah. Diesel minnow. I've been liking that one a lot. Cause that's another bait that you can kind of, you can work off the bottom. You don't really have to up and down, you know, jig it. So it's not picking up a bunch of stuff on the bottom. Um, you can just work it and it's so easy to work. All you do is just reel it in. Yeah, you and, and I were having that conversation of like the amount of time that we've fished with paddle tails 
and never just straight retrieved them. Where it like, yeah. uh, you know, game changer. Yeah, it's like you can just throw the paddle out there and reel it straight uh, back and yeah. fish weed it. <laughs> but I mean, especially this time of year when the water's really clear, I if if I can see fish, I really like to try and catch them on fly. Yeah, just because, um, you know, in the summer it's it's a little bit tougher. The water's dirtier. You, they're not really schooled up, so you can't just. You know, you got to be better with fly casting yeah. <laughs> in the summer for sure, because most be most quicker. of the time you're fishing to singles, um, and it's just cool to watch them. You know, eat the fly, yeah, because you definitely. can see, generally see it. Definitely, that that uh, brings me to a good question I want to ask here, Ethan um, Griffin, local guy. He's actually I got a podcast recorded with him, um, a weekend warrior series podcast. He just asked for you to tell him, Ethan, what your favorite flies are for winter redfish. I like to use clousers, yeah. um, you know, anything that's like chartreuse, like a chartreuse green, yellow hmm. with like a white underbelly is really good for me. Um, redfish quans are really good for me too. Um, but usually when I'm fishing those schools, I'm throwing clousers at them. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't really, I know it works and uh, I don't really come off of using that. The, the, like a small little profile clouser you like just something that yeah really... very small um i do like three three different sizes just a tiny one um a larger one and then uh i may have one here for you actually oh the goods and you guys if y'all have any other questions too feel free to fire them in here um and we will uh we'll do our best to answer them you can shoot them on over while he's getting that job what's your favorite fly my favorite fly is the special moment the special moment is that a custom (laughs) (laughs) i was just tying tying one up for a video one time and i had to had no name for it but it's what i usually throw and uh it i was like trying to think of a funny name and i called it the special moment because i've had a lot of special moments with that fly (laughs) but um if you want to check out the special moment go check out my youtube channel yeah there you go and you can figure out how to tie it and one thing that you turned me on to uh, uh, sorry i said Golly. it again i just um, saw the handle logged on is listening to uh, keep talking about how i turn she you on might beat time. me up when she gets back here she might um is using jig hooks yeah yes yes it's so much better. for the flies yeah for the flies yeah. like it was a great action yeah you flip that hook over and you get the the fly will ride hook up almost always if you put the the eyes on the bottom yeah yeah, the jig hook is awesome. And my our favorite jig hook, too, is uh, the Fly Shop in Redding, California. They've got I'll, – I'll drop a link on the Facebook page tomorrow, but they've got this awesome jig hook. You can get a pack of, like, 15 for 7 bucks or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's this – I forget the coating on it, but it holds up really well. You can tie on it really well. There's enough space, but it's not too big of a hook. Really, really great, really great jig hook. So, like I said, I'll drop that on the Facebook page tomorrow for any, any of y'all fly tires out there that want to check it out. But did you find that uh, that fly, Ethan? No, nah, it's on the it's in the other, but it's on the no boat. No worries, no worries. But like you that can't bring color your right there, if you could see that. Oh yeah, yep. With the little shimmery underglow there. Oh yeah, I think the I cool thing about that chartreuse that too, too well. is is you know you can the way you tie a fly like if you add a lot of it, it's a lot of pop. But if you just put a few strands of chartreuse in it, just a little, it just blends little. to like this real natural color. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it works very well in this clean water. For sure. Um, that's kind of what I stick with. Have you, uh, you got a dog I hear back there, right? You got a, what is it, a Chesapeake Bay? Yeah, I got a Chessie. Have you tied any flies with uh, any of any of the dog's hair? <laughs> it doesn't work too well. Too short? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, let me know. We've got a golden retriever. I've got a few golden, I call them the golden deceivers. <laughs> yeah. Golden deceiver flies. I've tied a couple of them. Did I actually it, caught a bunch of redfish and black trout in Louisiana with them. Yeah. yeah. Did you? Yeah, his ta- his hair tail is like tail hair. His hair tail, his tail hair is like seven inches long, and it's beautiful. So, <laughs> if y'all want any of that, hit me up after the show, and I'm selling at black market pricing. So, <laughs> yeah. I can ship it right. Five hundred dollars a fly. Five hundred dollars a fly. Secret but, um, weapon. But yeah, that chartreuse, man. I think people get well. A lot of soft plastic baits. The chartreuse is really bright. But when you tie it into a fly, like you're saying, that that yeah, lighter it does really amount, blend. Yeah. it blends so nicely to. Mm-hmm a really pretty natural color. I haven't used much chartreuse in the winter. I'm going to have to try that. Yeah. If it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. Yeah. If it ain't chartreuse. You got to say it in your Cajun accent, though. I can't do the Cajun accent on demand. <laughs> if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. 
Oh man. Well, well, sweet. Let's, uh, we've talked about trout. We've talked about redfish. Do you do any, do you ever focus on flounder as the, as the summer's coming on? Or is that more of a bycatch? It's more of a bycatch for me, really. Um, we can go catch flounder. Um, you know, I know where there's areas where there are some flounder around, but you know, I like to catch the redfish or trout. Yeah, mm-hmm. I hear you. I and hear it's you. especially like protecting them now, and you know, the size that we do see now inshore, you know, not off the beach, um, just isn't too too exciting to me right now. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it can be tough. It is. It's always a nice surprise, though. You're you know you're yeah. making a cast yeah. and you get a thump and it's a flounder. You know, like oh, I'm stuck mm-hmm. on the bottom again. <laughs> oh no way yeah that's how you know it's one <laughs> yeah it's uh i will say though man i've recently got into the the near shore flounder fishing and trying to dial that in more mm-hmm. um and the way the flounder eat out there is a whole different ball game like they will bend the rod over and the, if you're fishing live bait or you're fishing a jig but I, I remember i had one day this past fall where we were struggling on redfish in the ocean and went and flounder fished and we had mullet in the in the rod holders i mean it'd sit on the bottom for five minutes and it would they bend it over to the cork they were eating really? it so hard yeah it was it was silly i'm like why can't they do that inshore it'd be a little more interesting i know I'd be able right? to talk clients into it if uh, if we were doing that but and then we'd be targeting them <laughs> yeah have you <laughs> ever been able to sight fish a flounder i always like asking question that question to people yes that sight fish yes fish. i've had yeah. uh i've had one sight fish before which is uh i'm pretty and they just pop up and smoke it <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> for sure um well cool you got any more any more questions you you want to fire off no pressure yeah i mean uh, we talk, we so we kind of talked about winter red fishing but let's talk about like some of your summer tactics yeah oh yeah i forgot we're gonna cover that summertime the main reason i became a guide is so i could flood tide fish every flood and i didn't have to miss a single day there you go. Yeah. flood tide flood tide fishing is the best type of red fishing in my opinion that you could do um and it's a game you know what i mean you have you have like two, three hours in a flood. Um, you got to ease up on your fish. You got to present your fly, fly correctly. In um, a tiny spot. You don't trout set a red fish in the grass, which I see all summer long. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I, that that type of fishing is just it's it's so fun to me. You know, I, there's nothing more of a hunt than you know, targeting a redfish in Spartina grass, Mm -hmm. tailing its face off. And they're up there eating, you know, as long as you don't push on them too hard and they don't feel you and you present that fly, you know, you catch them on gurglers, on flies or light tackle, and they just blow up on it. Yeah. Which is, it's just, that's, that's too cool to me. No, it's, I think it's super cool. And, and like you're saying, the hunt aspect of the flood tide fishing Mm -hmm. is really cool. And the fact that you can see a fish tailing, and you get over there and he's not tailing anymore, you know, and the way that they can sneak through that grass and then all of a sudden he's tailing 10 feet, 15 feet over to the right. It just, it's an interesting game. It's a very, very fun game. And like Ethan said, they're there to feed. So yeah. you might not see as many as you see on a low tide, but every fish you see, if you present the fly or the soft plastic or whatever the correct way, they're going to, they're going to eat it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is like, it's got to be the pinnacle of sight fishing redfish. Yeah. Right. I'd agree. Um, it's, it's not just tailing fish, but tailing fish in the grass. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely challenging um, because one, most people are using a fly rod, which yep. is tough in itself. And then two, there's still grass sticking out of the water. <laughs> and nine times out of 10, your fly is getting stuck on something oh, yeah. before you get it into the like perfect zone. Unless you're just, most people are probably better casters than I am, but yeah, I always seem to get it caught on correct. something. <laughs> I'm just um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, one thing that I learned um, that I tried for the first time last summer was wade fishing yeah. for him. And the whole reason that I started doing that was because I had a, um, it was, it wasn't even a flood tide really, but there was, uh, and I was top water fishing and there was a little bit of flooded grass over on this bay and I walked and I was pulling by it and I saw two tails in the grass and it was like, you know, just this one little spot that had just enough water in it, but I couldn't get my boat into it. And so I walked into it. You can get like... Uh, you can walk right up you, to them. I literally, yes. I dangled my fly in front of the fish and it ate it. <laughs> I mean, Just straight down from your rod tip? Yeah, straight down from my rod tip. And my rod's, what, nine feet long or something like that? You know, you can get really close to yeah, them. Yeah, it is cool. 
That's super cool. Yeah, it's so if, cool. if you're like Cameron and you can't cast any further than the end of your rod tip, <laughs> yeah. and you need to catch redfish on the fly, that's a, yeah, that's another that's way, to, a good do way to do it. That's another way to do it. I'm with you. I think uh, one of the most important parts about fly fishing in the grass is having a good weed guard on your fly. Like yes, and if you're throwing mm. soft plastics or anything like that, having a good weed guard because there is nothing more frustrating. Then mm-hmm. working hard for a good shot and going to throw the fly or soft plastic and snagging up with the grass and having to jerk it out of the grass and the fish spooks. Um, do you have any specific, I know what I like, but do you have Ethan, any specific when you're tying bugs for the grass weed guard that you like? I know that's a very specific question, but, um, just 30 pound mono. Um, I just tie that on there. Do you and do that a works. single or do you like to like V it up and do a double? <laughs> I do single and double. Um, I just go single. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I don't want too much on that fly. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that single works good. Um, but like what you were saying, like that first time seeing that fish, and you have like a client on your boat or one of your boys on the boat. Um, usually, when that opportunity comes, everything goes wrong for that first fish. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. People get wrapped up in their fly line. They sh- overshoot it. They land on it. You know, it's it's one of those things. Like when it happens, your knees start shaking, your wrists start shaking. You're just it, there's buck fever. What'd you say? Buck fever. Buck fever. <laughs> yes, exactly. And everything goes wrong. And then you like you just take a deep breath after that one. And you know, if you have a client on your boat or you know somebody that you can control and walk them through. You know, you can get them to, you know, put that fly in front of them. And usually when I'm talking to my clients through that um, and I can walk them through what to do, you know, that's like when we get there, eats. But as soon as like the client or your friends start thinking and thinking and thinking, you know, stuff goes wrong. Um, But that's the whole fun part of flood tide fishing. Yeah, man. It's fun. One fish in the grass is worth 10 anywhere else. What about for – what's your go-to for um, spin fishing in the grass? Good question. Just a jerk shad. Um, I, I'm, I stick with those uh, bad shads, Z-Man bad shads, um, on a weedless rig mm-hmm. and just bring it right across them, and they just – they love that. Anything do you, scented. Do you um, – Yeah, that scent scared. is huge in the grass. Is it? I, I yeah, mean, yeah. you don't have to have it, but they definitely – I can see, yeah, it, I yeah. can see that. Um, yeah. So like some of the fish that I've fished to in the grass, um, with a spinning rod, I'll, I use jerk sheds too, but like, I'll get it close to them and it's like, they don't notice it. And I'm like, Oh man, should I keep working it? Should I stop it? Yeah. Like, what do, how do you work that when like they're just head down in the grass eating stuff and your lure is so close to them where you're, you don't, if you work it anymore, it's going to move past them. Are you waiting for them to kind of start moving or are you just going to work it past them anyways? Nah, that's tough. I mean, if you're not hung up on any grass and you're not going to bump too much grass, just slowly bring it in front of them. But, I mean, if you're in some thick grass and if you give it a yank and it's going to, you know, bump, bounce a bunch of that Spartina grass, then I just let it sit, let that fish pass and get it out and then, you know, present another cast to that fish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But as soon as you start like bouncing that grass around, those fish will, they'll feel it and they'll be out. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a huge part of it, man. And something that I learned the hard way is if you make a bad cast on the fish, if it's a real bad cast and it's, it's far away from them, bring it in and go again. But if you make a get bad cast, that's close to them. Let them move out of that zone. Then pick the bait up and cast again. Cause when they're mm-hmm. in the grass, they're spending some time up there. As long as you don't freak them out, they're going to stay up there and keep tailing and keep moving around. But so many times have I blown it myself and I've had, you know, clients mess it up usually because I tell them to get the fly out of there. I get nervous. I want to get the fly in front of the fish, but mm-hmm. sometimes waiting to, to bring that bait out of there to get another cast is, is very important and, and will pay off. So, yeah. um, take your time. You've got definitely got more time on the tailing red fish in the grass. I feel like than you do, you know, a belly crawler or whatnot in the summer, you've got that time to think about it, pick it apart, wait for that fish to move to an open section of grass. Um, and go from there. Griffin asked another question. He said, never caught a flood tide red. What are some tips to start? I think first off it's, you know, finding some productive areas and, and finding that flooded grass is important. You're wanting that short Spartina grass, mm-hmm. um, Spartina, Spartina, whatever you want to call it. And I mean, they'll, they'll tail on some of the taller stuff, but I always tell people, look around the islands all along the waterway. There's these, you know, these islands, these trees, um, with the shorter Spartina grass around them and just start, 
start getting up in that area and, and working through that as that water gets up in there. Don't rush in there. Give that water some time to, to fill up. You want, I feel like, I mean, you'll see them in less, but that like seven, eight, 10, 12 inches of water is, is typically, I'd say maybe seven to 12 inches is that real hot spot for, yeah. for tailing redfish. And it can get too high too. Yeah. Like it, they're still up there. But yeah. They're still up there, but they're just really hard to find. Really hard to find. Yeah. Th- those are frustrating. I feel like we had a lot of those last year. The tides that got really big. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. And, and with the grass too, like there's like this happy medium, Ethan, I feel like the, if you disagree, let me know, but you, you don't want to work too fast, but you definitely don't want to work too slow either. Cause you've got that time limit, mm-hmm. you know, of, of time you can be up there. Um, and finding that right pace. I mean, if there's a lot of fish in your zone, work really slow. But if you feel like you're not seeing much, try to cover some area until you get to where some of those little pods of fish are. What's, what, do you feel like you like to work pretty slow in an area or, or work pretty fast through it? So what I do on that rising tide, <clears throat> just as that grass is starting to flood, I'll just pull the boat up and then just park. And I'll sit and watch for 15, 20 minutes. I don't see anything rise or any movement. Then, you know, I'll bounce to the next spot. Yeah. Um, and then maybe, you know, later on that evening or that morning, um, swing back by as that, you know, that water's coming out of that area as it's starting to get skinny again. Just just check it again. But usually, you know, you'll see those fish rise up as soon as they can. Once mm-hmm. they can push into that grass, those fish. Yeah, they, they, they like have more a good of incoming. Yeah. Uh-huh. As falling. soon as they can slide, they're, that's when you find them. Um, and then you see a few rise up. I mean, you don't have to push on them immediately you know let them get it higher up in that flat and then see if something's following them you know um but it, you just don't want to push on those fish too hard because you you're not going to get you know 30 shots at fish here you yeah. know it's yeah. it's not it's not like that here i mean we saw some awesome days last year which i'm hoping it's like that again this year but again to see you know all those shots you, you just don't want to blow any of them no i'm with you for being I'm, impatient i'm with you and i i've i've lost i mean i still love i love flood tide fishing but it's uh it's gotten frustrating like when i was younger man it's there was a lot of fish i mean every flat you went to that should have fish on it had fish on it and there i mean it's still worth flood tide fishing it still can be great but mm-hmm. Um, and Ethan, I know we've talked a lot about the, you know, conservation our area and, and the struggle for our redfish to just make it to, you know, a decent catchable size. That's that you don't have to like talk up to your clients, man, that's a beautiful 15 inch redfish you just caught. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but man, just, we just, we've got to get our crap together as far as conservation goes and the decline of fish I see very heavily, like in the tailing fishing. And mm-hmm. I, I feel like it just, it, it, it plays or it's just very evident for me there, or I'm just getting really terrible at, at it. I mean, there's, yeah, I'm still having some good days where I'm going out and seeing, you know, 10, 12 fish. But, um, I mean, back when I was a kid in high school and I would go out and flood tide fish, I'd just go take a bay boat and go walk and see like 25 fish. Mm-hmm. And that is, that doesn't happen anymore for me. I mean, maybe I'm just fishing the wrong stuff, but, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, and it is the most incredible, like you're saying, Ethan, the most incredible type of, of red fishing. And it's something I don't want to see go away. You know, North Carolina, there, there's like really th- here, South Carolina, Georgia, and Northern Florida, are like really the only places mm-hmm. in the world that redfish tail like that. And, mm-hmm. and so we want to, we need to protect our fish and, and whatnot. So sorry, that was my little spiel there, Ethan, but it's, no, it's good. It's yeah, good. It's uh, it, it, it's, it's tough, man. It's tough. But, um, but yeah, if y'all want to flood tide fish, hit up Ethan. Cause I, I'm a little pissed off at flood tide fishing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he, I, I, he definitely, I feel like caught, you caught a lot more fish in the grass than I did last year. I was like, yeah. dang, man, that guy's getting them every, every flood tide. I got to go. I was like, I was telling people, man, the flood tide's not worth it. I'm going to get, let's go fish at low tide. And then Ethan would post pictures of like four tailing redfish. And I was like, son of a gun. <laughs> so, it's but just to answer, so fun to me, man. Oh dude, it it's awesome. It is, it's, it's the best way. Minus the freaking bugs. The no see Minus so, the bugs. Minus the bugs. Without the bugs. Yeah. Oh, and I want to take my wife so badly, but I know she will be miserable oh, if I took her out there. Oh, I made that mistake once. You took Melissa out there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was not happy. It's not happy. bad when you're on the platform, though. No. No, you're no, down there no. Sitting there she was, on the... she, and she was like, should I wear pants? And I was like, 
no, nah, you're good. <laughs> 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 Terrible mistake. Oh, gosh. Because she was freaking out the whole time. She had bugs all over her. But to oh. answer uh, Griffin's question um, yeah. about, like, what to look for. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a really good article that actually one of our guests wrote, Owen Player. Yeah. Um, about flood tide fishing and, like, how to use Google Maps to your advantage. And, you know, the feeder creeks is a big deal. But, I mean, in, in my opinion – some of the best uh, flood tide flats are in on the edge of bays where there's a lot of access where there's a lot of access um because you got to think in a big bay there's more fish per i don't know square foot and it's just than, a lot easier like for them to get there yeah yeah and it, i mean there's just yeah there's just more fish i feel like especially in the summer in areas like that definitely than in like a little creek so if there's just a teeny little creek that you follow all the way back and then there's a flat, like a grass flat. Generally, I mean, you could be, get lucky, but generally that kind of flat won't have as many fish on it as like uh, a, a flat that's like close to a big body of water. Yeah. I think too, like going off, I, that just had me, my, my wheels turning a little bit. Like those fish don't want to swim through a ton of the really thick grass to get to the right type of grass where the fiddler crabs are. Mm-hmm. You know, they want that, that short little jump between you know thick grass or a creek that runs right up to that flat they're not going to swim through you know a couple hundred yards of really really thick grass to get i mean they, they will but but your chances are if you're trying to eliminate areas to that you shouldn't fish and look for those areas that you should look for stuff with a lot of easy access and and i'd say the key factor in all of this is fiddler crabs you know is, yeah. is and not that they won't go up on a flat and eat shrimp and mullet and all kinds of stuff like that but you know, the real draw is the fiddler crabs. And if, if there's an area that doesn't have fiddler crabs, they're probably not going to be there, in, in, at least in any real number. Um, do you have any, any tips there, Ethan, as far as what you really like to see for a productive flood tide flat? No, oh, you guys are nailing it. Um, and then look for those access points, too, when you get up to a flat. You know, where there's an opening, you know, for water to come into that flat, those are that's where the fish are going to come through. So, yeah. Don't set up right in the middle of, you know, the opening where these fish slide into, you know, come up yep. to the side, you Good know, point. back past the current, let that current put the, push those fish in, you know, yeah. you don't want to cut those fish off. We Would just you? had a sabbatical. Let me say this real quick. Sabbatical charters. He said, um, um, not just you sunset beach area. 15 years ago, I had such a different group of reds. I see a major drop in the North Carolina, South Carolina, yeah. South Carolina line, which is. You know, the more we talk about this, the more people I'm bumping into and meeting that are feeling the same way as mm-hmm. far as, you know, this is not what it used to be. Not just, and he's not even talking about flood tide fishing. He's just talking about, you know, fishing redfish in general. In general. Intro fishing, um, yeah. And so we're not going to make this a political podcast, um, but. There is change coming. There's change coming. Yeah. So keep your eyes peeled. Me, Ethan, Cameron, we're all working in the background to hopefully you know, band together as anglers to maybe hopefully see some change in our lifetime. But definitely, I mean, if we don't see change in our lifetime, we're, we're probably doomed as far as a fishery goes. <laughs> I'm but, moving to South Carolina. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> Me for too. Real. Hey, here's a question for you. Have you ever had, um, I interrupted you too. What did, what were you saying? I don't remember. Don't remember. Okay. Have you ever had any of those like, Oh shoot moments. I better get out of the grass and where you're just sweating your balls oh, off, God. Pu- pulling the boat, oh, like just bro. dragging it through the grass. I, yeah, I've been pushing the skiff through the – yeah, I've been oh. there multiple times, not just once. It's – I mean, I'll get puckered up nervous. Like this boat oh, is going to yeah, be sitting yeah, here yeah. until tomorrow night. <laughs> Never yeah. has happened, but if you've I ever gotten your skiff it. stuck like, overnight – like, Oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, you got it. You got it. But it, it's like those moments in which you see like three or four fish. Yeah, you back know what behind I mean? you where you're already trying to – Yes, leave. yeah. <laughs> They were like, hold off, guys. Don't tail yet. Don't tail. All right, you can start tailing now. (laughs) And they get you to come pull back over there, and they just dart off, and your boat's stuck. (laughs) You're high (laughs) and dry. Ethan, have you ever caught um, a sheep's head in the grass? No, I have not. But I've seen them, and they are the most difficult fish to get to eat in the grass. Dude, I got the secret fly for you. You don't know what it is? Yeah, what is it? It's a cast net. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> need to keep a cast Dude, net on the boat for the sheep have you guys caught one in the grass i have not i've casted at plenty of them i've, I've had never two, been able to get eat i've had two eat in down in the cape lower cape fear on small flies i had a seven weight rigged up with small flies one there was one summer i was like i'm gonna do this and that both times they ate a little small chartreuse looked like a little bonefish shrimp um with a weed guard on it 
never even hooked both of them. They're, they've got all those teeth, and it's so hard to freaking hook them with a small hook. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, think about how hard it is to hook them like with a jig head when you're fishing for them. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. they're, they're they're notorious bait stealers. So hard to feed. They had the pressure, yes. strip set, you know, a little bit of pressure, and both times they came off. And they were both during the same, like, flood tide. Not that night, but the same couple days. I hooked two, and then uh, I tried some more that summer and never did. I've caught sheep's head on the fly in Louisiana and in Texas, but but – they're different freaking sheep's head down there. That's you can't compare them to our sheep's and they're head big, oh. and they're freaking big. Yeah, well, yeah, yep. So, but yeah, they're uh, they're they're pretty pretty fun fish. Have you caught any black drum in the grass? Tail in the grass? No, I've seen them in there though. I just no, I haven't. Have you guys? No, I haven't. I've seen them, but I haven't. I haven't. I've uh, hooked one in the grass. You hooked one in the grass. Get into the boat. Gotcha. It's, uh, During the summer, I see a lot of the smaller ones floating through the grass too. Yeah. You see um, a bunch of small ones up there. I think we need to tie a snail fly for the sheep. <laughs> yeah, it's coming up real. and eating the snails <laughs> off the grass. Yeah. 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 But, um, so, so more about summer red fishing. Do you have a favorite top water that you like to use? Ooh, um, top dogs, top pups. Um, I kind of stick with those. Those are kind of my – I like skitter walks too. How do you feel about the uh, she dog? She dog. She dog. She dog's good, but I like she dog for trout. You like the she yeah. dog for trout? I like that. She dog's a louder yeah. one, right? High yeah, pitch. higher pitch. I keep it's yelling into this mic. I need to turn this down just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like blowing my eardrums out. That yeah, that high pitch is is uh, I hate that freaking she dog, dude. I you love it. You catch it is so many fish. It's my go to. Yeah, I freaking you like love the she dog, huh? Yeah, it's funny, man. How it's it's all about what you throw the most. I yeah, feel like because I fish. Spook, I really like. I used to fish skitter walks more, but now I've, I mean, I pretty much only have spooks. Um, the Spook yes, Juniors, yes. the you know, all the, all the sizes, and fish them for, for you know, different different fish. That one knocker though, that freaking chartreuse and white one knocker has been. It's, what, a, it's a spook. It's a head and spook. Yeah, I tried. I tried using some. I I used the smaller spooks for trout a lot. This um, yeah, the spring man. Spook those juniors are awesome yeah. for trout. Mm-hmm. I think so. My my theory is, for tight walking, I feel like I can walk a bait really tight. With the he dog, the she dog, the pup, whatever they're all called, they've got more of a concave in the belly, mm-hmm. and I feel like I can get that bait to cut really tight. Mm-hmm. And then skitter walk is is a little looser, and then the the spook is is even more loose. And you like it? I looser? like that loose. Well, I like those long glides when I'm walking it. Hmm. Um, but but for trout, like y'all are saying, y'all like those other baits for the trout. You can sit there and walk the with like a with like a top dog or a or a skitter walk. I can sit there and keep it in one area really well, like mm-hmm. twitch, twitch, twitch. And like, it doesn't really move that far forward. Um, yeah. And th- yeah, I think that's, I mean, maybe that that's probably getting way too nitpicky, but if we're going to sit here all. and do a podcast every week for y'all, we're going to have to dive into some wormholes yeah. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but yeah, that, that's, that's my take. Um, and it just depends on how you like to work the bait. So dude, so I'm we're ready at- for that top water bite to come back though. Dude, it's about too. time. Me too. I know. Have you had any red fish in the top water in the past couple of weeks, past month or two? No, I've thrown it at them. They're just, they're just not, not quite there yet. It. Yeah, not there yet. I hear you. I got a secret spot where the, all they eat is top waters, but I can't tell anybody <laughs> where that is. I'm just. <laughs> I wish I had. Bro. Sure. I'll send you a pin. I'll send anyone on this on the show a pin of where that is. Sometimes they're not there, so if you go there and they're not there, I'm sorry, but it's a hundred dollars. Just hit me up. Um, but we're at an hour, man. Do you have any other, um, you know, tips or anything you want to leave us with? Any words of wisdom? If no, not, just get no out there. Eat more donuts. <laughs> Eat more donuts. Eat more donuts. That's it. Dude, it's you need to get a shirt with... made that with a with a dude on a skiff chowing down on a donut that says "Eat more donuts" and <laughs> sell it at your shop. <laughs> I think that would be great. That'd be, I think That'd it be would awesome. Sell really well. Yeah, I do too. But sorry, I totally interrupted you. Get out. You were saying what? Um. Oh. Um, well, just spend time on the water. If you want to go find fish and you want to get good at fishing, it's all about time on the water. You know, the more time you spend out there and the more water that you cover you know, the, the better of a fisherman you'll be for what you see in those areas. You know, you may have to switch it up for different fish in different spots. Um, for sure. Use different tactics for different fish. Um, so just spend time on the water. I always get that question on my Instagram. How do you catch these fish? What are, what are you doing here? What are you doing there? Just go out there, spend time, throw different things. It's yeah. not one thing that's going to work in every spot. No. Unless it's summertime, you throw top water. I don't know. Yeah. 
<laughs> top water will get it done. But then you get, then you got options on top waters, and you got three people telling you three different pitches of top water to use. <laughs> different pitches, different cadences. This one. Will Damn it! Move. I don't know which one to buy. <laughs> I know we're having questions pop up. They're like, keep the top water talk coming. So we'll do we'll do another. We did a top water. If you really want to hear top water, we did. Me and Billy did a top water episode. Last summer, you can go back on YouTube or on the pod. I think it's mm-hmm. called like Top Water Talk. I can't mm-hmm. remember. We dive into Top Water, but I think we should do another Top Water episode soon. Uh, oh, maybe man, like a I'd Top Water to. round. I table. could talk. I could talk about Top Waters for an, I could too. easily for an hour. I could too. Um, oh, I'm gonna start calling you Top Water. Top Water Cam. Top Water Cam. I wish your name was Tom. <laughs> it's Top Water Tom. I can well, Ethan, change it. Thank you so much, man, for coming on to the show. If people want to reach out and book a trip with you, or pick your brain, or try to ask you for where you where you fish, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Stellar Angler, um, and then yeah, just find me on Facebook and Instagram. So, it's yeah. usually you know my best way of booking people. For those of y'all that are listening, his his then not watching. It's Stellar Angler underscore Guide. So that's is that yep. how on Facebook as well? Same deal. Uh, Stellar Angler Guide Service on Facebook. Stellar Angler Guide Service. Okay, sweet. So mm. and uh, and if you're at Topsail, swing in and grab a donut. Go pick up a donut. Yeah, I need one, one of those sick donut. new T-shirts. I've he's never been made. there. Yeah, that, I need to go get some. My nephews and nieces freaking love that place, man. Every time they come down Do to they? my mom's house in the summer, yeah, I'll, I'll go up there after a guy trip or something. There's like boxes of your donuts sitting up there. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a I bacon? Did you have a bacon donut last year? Yes, we still have it. Oh my, that sounds that disgusting. donut is, <laughs> is it, <laughs> it is delicious. It's delicious. Is, is, it maple? is it maple? and maple? bacon oh, and cinnamon. That does sound good, actually. Go. I, I ate a Krispy Kreme burger one time, and that was good. So I guess a maple bacon donut <laughs> would be good. Makes sense. <laughs> but, uh, well, sweet, man. Well, you guys, if y'all enjoyed the show, it just helps us out so much. Some things that you can do are, one, just tell your friends about it. Um, two, you can definitely share this broadcast. Let me switch off Ethan's face as I talk. You can share this broadcast on your Instagram. I mean, on your Facebook page. Just click that share button right now. And share it out if you enjoyed watching it. Um, another thing that really helps us if you go on to iTunes or the podcast platforms that you listen to the podcast on, um, you can leave a, I guess, a, yeah, leave a review. So mm-hmm. five star reviews. It'll only let you leave five star reviews. So if you try to, <laughs> if you try to not leave a five star review, you'll get. We'll come and find you. Yeah, we'll come and find you. I'm just kidding. Leave a leave an honest review, but you don't want to be the first one that leaves less than yeah, a five star review. Not. So what, what? you know. Uh, but yeah, leave, leave a review on the podcast platforms. You can go over, check out our YouTube channel. We've got all these episodes on YouTube as well as the podcast platforms. I'm going to, my tongue's going to fall off. I keep saying podcast platforms, but, um, we also have other videos, you know, dive into different pieces of tackle some days on the water fishing and me and me and, uh, cam are going to be doing a lot more fishing videos as the summer uh, progresses. And, and so just stay tuned for all that. Go check out that Facebook group and more than anything, just talk to your friends about this podcast and, and check out our next episode. We'll be live next week. Um, and got a pretty awesome guy coming on. George Poveromo actually really? is going to be coming on. Uh, he's going to Skype in next week as our guest. And so we're stoked about that. He's, if you don't know who George Poveromo is, just Google his name. Super Super famous guy um, has caught fish all around the world and has just has a ton of knowledge. So well, he used to have like a big fishing show, right? Yeah, or does he, he big, still? Yeah, he has, he still has a show. Um, I don't know what, if it. I don't know if it's still airing or not, but he, he does a lot of uh, traveling and seminars. And yeah, I yep. think he's still doing his his show and um, just a, a ton of great knowledge and and just a really really nice guy. I remember um, I spoke at one of his seminars two years ago and had never met him, and we had that hurricane hit. Um, Florence, like he, yeah. he had, we had set, set the seminar up or he had set the seminar up. I I said, I could speak at it. And that was like months before the hurricane. And then he called me and texted me after the hurricane to see how I was doing. Just like salt of the earth, really nice guy, um, with a lot of fishing information and knowledge. So be sure to, uh, to, to check that episode out next week and we will see y'all then. Hopefully if not, we'll see you on the water. <laughs> <laughs> I just snotted all over the microphone later y'all.